Good evening, everyone. <laughs> Lovely to see you here. So welcome to the Science Museum, and welcome to this evening's event. My name is Andrew McCauley, and I'm the chairperson of Kaduri Farm. And it is my greatest pleasure to introduce to you uh, tonight's speaker, Dr. Satish Kumar. So Satish will be speaking to us on the subject, holistic economics, how to maximize your true wealth. Satish was born in India. He became a Jain monk at the age of nine. At the age of 18, he joined the land reform movement of Vinoba Bhav, who was one of the successors to Gandhi. Then in his mid-twenties, he undertook an 8,000-mile peace pilgrimage, walking from India to America, it says on my sheet. I'm sure you didn't swim across the Atlantic. It must have been a boat. <laughs> Walking on water. <laughs> and that was to deliver packets of peace tea to the leaders of the four nuclear powers at the time. And if you're interested in that incredible journey, you can read about it in his autobiography, which is called No Destination. Crucially, Satish carried no money on this journey, which I think makes him uniquely qualified to deliver a talk on this subject about true wealth. Satish was also the co-founder of the Schumacher College in, in Devon in the UK and longtime editor of Resurgence and uh, well, what is now also Ecologist magazine. Now, back in the early 70s, when Satish was uh, first invited to be the editor of Resurgence, he declined. And it was E.F. Schumacher, uh, who, who was the author of the famous book, Small is Beautiful, and after whom the Schumacher College was named, it was E.F. Schumacher who invited him to tea at his house to try and persuade him uh, to take up this position. And he said to Satish, Satish, why won't you accept the editorship of Resurgence? And Satish said, well, I have to get back to India. I, I'm, I'm part of the Gandhian movement there, and I need to get back to my work. And Schumacher said, but Satish, there are many Gandhis in India, and we don't have one in England. So, <laughs> so Satish had nothing to say to that. And, uh, the rest is destiny. So now wherever a Gandhi is needed, Satish will go. So two years ago, Kaduri Farm put out the word that a Gandhi was needed in China. And fortunately, the Schumacher College also had uh, China in their sights as a place where they wanted to have some influence. So we had a, a perfect uh, partnership developed between Kaduri Farm and the Schumacher College and a and, and very personal uh, partnership and relationship with Satish. So this is his third visit to Hong Kong uh, that we have had the great pleasure of hosting. And I, I think that we are looking at annual visits, so this is not the last time that we will see him. Satish, as you'll see, is a very eloquent speaker, and he speaks straight from the heart and he wastes no words. So please join me in welcoming Satish. Thank you, thank you, thank you. <coughs> thank you, Andrew, for your warm welcome and, and wonderful warm introduction. And as uh, Andrew said, this is my third visit to Hong Kong. I never thought 
that I will feel at home in Hong Kong. <laughs> uh, but uh, Andrew's Welcome and Kaduri Farm, which is a beautiful 500-acre mountain farm and uh, blessed by goddess uh, um, Quang, Quin Yang, Quin Yam. And so we made a pilgrimage to the top of the mountain and paid our homage to the queen, the goddess. And it's such a lovely place. So I feel when I arrive there very much at home in the hospitality of Kaduri Farm and Andrew and Andy and Pinhan and all the team there. And I'm delighted that they have organized such a wonderful evening tonight. <clears throat> I would like to speak about uh, economics and also ecology, because by putting ecology together with economics makes the holistic economics. <clears throat> I want to start with my story, which some of you might have heard, because I have related this story before, but just to, for people who have not heard it. Not long ago, I was invited to speak at London School of Economics. Now, many of you have heard of London School of Economics. It's one of uh, British great uh, universities. And when I arrived there, I asked the learned professor, who was my host, um, said, this is London School of Economics. Do you teach ecology? Where is your department for ecology? And she said, no, we have some uh, environmental studies or development, uh, sustainable development studies or world studies, but we don't have a, a department for ecology. So I said, do you know the meaning of the word ecology and economy? You are a learned professor, so I dare I say, and ask you, do you know the meaning of the words? She said, what do you mean? I said, the word ecology and economy come from the same root in Greek language. They are made of three words, oikos, logos, nomos. Oikos means home. And from oikos comes eco. So home. First of all, you have your personal home, where you live. You have your bedroom, your bathroom, your kitchen, your living room, your garden. If you are lucky in Hong Kong <laughs> to have a garden. And then your home extends. And then your town becomes home, your country becomes home, your continent becomes home, and ultimately, the entire planet is your home the planet home, the earth home. Now, this is a wisdom of the Greek philosophers. They thought that our home is ever expanding territory. It's not narrowing territory. Of course, your body is your home, first of all. And you have to take care of your body. And then you take care of your personal home, your country home, your planet home. So oikos is home. And home is a place of relationships. So when you go home, what do you have at home? You have relations. You have your father, your mother, your husband, your wife, your daughter, your son, your friends, your guests, even the chair in which you sit, you have a relationship. The pots and pans in which you cook, you have a relationship. The soil in which you grow, which you grow your food, which I do in my home, and I would like every person to have connection with soil. Even if you live in Hong Kong, in those high-rise buildings, please have a, a pot with some real soil organic soil with putting some compost in it. And you can make compost from your kitchen waste. 
You don't have to go to supermarket to buy compost. So touch the soil. The home is not a home which has no soil, no plant. So I would say even in Hong Kong, in high-rise buildings, try to have a pot or a few pots where you can have a soil and a plant and some herbs and some flowers. So that is home. And logos means knowledge of home. Logos, the same word as logic. So knowledge of home. And then that becomes ecology. Ecology means knowledge of home. So the planet home is how all the relationships fit in together. Because humans are dependent on other sources of life. As I said, soil. Without the soil, without the earth, we cannot have food. Even though in Hong Kong, you think food comes from supermarkets. But food doesn't come from supermarkets. And the food which comes from supermarkets, packaged in plastic, is not really very healthy food. If you want healthy food, look for some farmer's markets. You might have even in Hong Kong some farmer's markets. And where if the farmers are selling carrots with a little bit of earth around it, buy that one. And not in plastic wrapped, already washed in some kind of chemical water. So relationship is the hallmark of a home. And ecology means knowledge of those relationships. How? Even the birds flying in the sky is our kith and kin, our relations. Even a deer in the forest is our brother and sister. Even a snake, which you might think poisonous or you might be afraid of. If you live in rural China or rural India, you will not be afraid of snakes because there are very few snakes which are really dangerous and poisonous. Most snakes are very, very um, um, benign. There's no danger. So even the snakes are our kith and kin, our relations. And so knowledge of that relationship is ecology. I didn't explain in such a detail to my professor. I'm explaining to you now. And then I said economy is Nomos means management. So you are, I said to my professor, who was my host, I said, you are teaching your students economy, how to manage your home without knowing your home, without ecology. Now, please tell me how anyone is going to manage something which they don't know. Can you manage something which you don't know? So you are educating your young students only half of the story. Knowledge and management go hand in hand together. So you are sending these thousands upon thousands of graduates around the world to manage their household in Africa, in India, in America, even in China, even in Hong Kong, many people go to LSE to study economics and come back to Hong Kong. So you are sending these young uh, graduates all over the world to manage something they don't know. So they are half educated. And in my view, half educated is worse than uneducated like half-baked food, half-baked bread. If you eat half-baked bread, what happens? It gives you indigestion. So no wonder that the world economy is suffering from indigestion. And so I suggested to my professor in LSE that please change the name of your university and call it LSEE, -E, London School of Ecology and Economics. 
then you will be educating them properly. So what beautiful word we have, economy. It's a lovely word, Ma proper management of home. Now in classic economics, was a very good priority. The classic economics is land, labor, capital. Those were the three classic words. At the top comes land. And land represents the entire natural ecosystem. Forests are on the land. Food grows from the land. Animals are nurtured and nourished and taken care of on the land. The houses are built on the land. Land is the primary part, primary aspect and dimension of true, good, holistic economics. So land is sacred. Land is basic. It's not a commodity. So taking care of the land is the first and foremost principle of holistic economics. And then comes labor. Labor is a shorthand for makers, producers, people. We are all labor. We all work. Of course, nowadays, we don't work, especially in cities like Hong Kong. You sit behind your desk in front of your computer and the Blackberry or nowadays iPhone or iPad in your hand. I don't call it labor. Not much labor in it. But we should be labor. We should be doing manual labor, using our hands. And in universities like LSE, and even I was speaking yesterday in your uh, city university of Hong Kong, and I said that how much our education involves hands. It's mostly brain education, head education. And I say that education should be about head, heart, and hands. Without hands, if we don't know how to make something, how to produce something, we cannot really be called educated. And it should involve heart. Without the feeling heart, without developing compassion in our education, without developing a sense of service to each other, without developing a sense of, sense of gratitude to each other and to nature. How can we be called educated? So development of heart, feelings, generosity, friendship, love, a sense of service is part of education and economics. If you want to talk about holistic economics, you cannot leave your heart out. We are human beings with a complete universal dimension in microcosm. We have everything what is in the universe. We are microcosm of macrocosm. We are made of spirit, soul, heart, feelings, imagination, as well as our physical body, earth, air, fire, water, space, Consciousness, all these qualities, elements are there in our bodies. We are embodiment of body and spirit, mind and spirit. And so head, heart, and hands, these three elements are together. Then I would call it a proper education. And if that was proper education, then labor, making things with our hands, beautiful things, making with our hands, will be part of economy. And then, of course, the third dimension is capital, which is also very important. Money is not a bad thing. Capital has a place. It's a wonderful invention as a means of exchange, as a means to an end. But we, in modern economics, have turned the table upside down. And we have put capital at the top. And the land and people, labor, have become commodities. We use land to speculate, to buy and sell. 
And when land is producing food, then it's not real land. It's not real estate. It's unreal. Because you're only producing food. What's the value of it? Agricultural land is not called real estate. Real estate, it, estate or land becomes real only when it has become a commodity to buy and sell, mainly for development. There's a real estate. And the value of real estate just goes up sky high. That's a real estate. We call it real estate. It's not real. In my view, it's unreal estate. And so capital has a place. Money, finance has a place but we must keep it in its place. Put it in its place. And do not allow capital to dominate our lives. And so ecology and economy coming together creates our true holistic understanding of our lives. And then we realize what is true wealth. Because the moment you say land, labor, capital, then you understand what is true wealth. At the moment, we think wealth means money. And bankers are called wealth creators. I wonder if they are really wealth creators or are they wealth destroyers. True wealth is natural capital, the forest. If your water is not clean, if your air is not clean, if the forests are gone, the animals in factory farms, and you have lots of money. In my view, that is not true real wealth. Wealth is connected with well-being. Wealth is connected with well-being. Now, you have money, 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 but no good relationship, no good health, no happiness, no joy in life. Then that is not, you, are, you don't have well-being. And without well-being, you cannot call it wealth. So well-being comes from relationships. Relationship with your family. If you put money and capital before your family, and I have seen many families breaking down, and even recently in India, two brothers, millionaires, two brothers, two of the richest brothers of India killed each other because of their dispute on money. So if your relationships with, between your family, relationship with your workers and neighbors, and you want to capital, 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 but no care for labor and your workers and your staff, that's not well-being. And then, most of all, if our relation with the natural world is not right, and if our forests are used just for making money and capital, that's not true wealth. And then, more importantly, even, I would say, our hands, our imagination, our creativity, and our skills are true wealth. Human skills. And the modern education is creating a rather de-skilled society. We teach our children what is called in England three R's. Reading, writing, arithmetic. Jokingly, I say to my English friends that it seems that you don't even know how to spell three R's. Reading, writing, arithmetic. Arithmetic is not three R's. Anyway, joke apart. They are teaching three R's. I would say those three R's should be replaced by three H's, which I mentioned to you just now. Head, heart, and hands. And maybe four H's. Home. Eco means home. If we know how to care for our home and take care of relationships between people, between families, between uh, communities, between races, and also between people and nature, that relationship will be eco. At the moment, our education is developing not eco, not relationship, but ego, separation, dualism. You are separate. 
you are worker, I am the boss. You are farmer, I am the industrialist. You are farmer, I am the banker. Farmer is down there. A farmer is paid maybe 100 Hong Kong dollar a day, whereas a banker will be paid maybe 100,000 or 10,000 or 50,000 Hong Kong dollars a day. Why? Why food producers should have no dignity? Why food producers should have no uh, respect? And the banker should be, in my view, if it was a true holistic economics, I would pay a farmer more than I'll pay a banker. Because without bank, we can survive. But without food, we cannot survive. We cannot eat plastic cards. We cannot eat your Visa and American Express cards. But we have to eat vegetables. Carrots are more important than Visa card. You can say, I can buy carrots from Visa card. But if there are no carrots, what will you buy? If there are no potatoes, what will your Visa Express card will buy? Nothing. So food is primary. So we must bring back dignity, true dignity to farmers. People in Hong Kong don't even think of farmers. The bankers, the stockbrokers, the business leaders, they don't think about farmers. They take farmers for granted, food growers for granted. And they think that food is a commodity to buy and sell and speculate. And therefore, we can grow food in any way we like. And therefore, chemicals, fertilizers, pesticide, herbicide, and now we are going into genetically engineered seeds. Now, if that is economy, I would not call it holistic economy, and I would not call it even economy, which I describe to you as land, labor, capital. And so we need to be mindful of our relationships with the food and with the farming and with the food growers and with nature altogether. Nations decay when they lose contact with nature. Communities decay when our children have nature deficit disorder, as Richard Liu has coined the term nature deficit disorder. And so I would like to see, if you want to bring true holistic economics in our society, where land, labor, and capital have their appropriate place, then I would like to see every school having some access to land. Children, at least once a week, going and touching the earth. If your school has no land, connect with some farm, even Kaduri farm, or somewhere nearby, or even north of Hong Kong border in the mainland China. Connect with some land, and children should touch the earth. Be among the trees. Look at the flowers. Go along the river. If nature is not there, we cannot have economy. The way I have described economy and ecology, if our relationship with nature, the environment, the earth, is not there, and if we just live in high-rise um, buildings and come out of that box into a car and then come out of that car into an office and then go back into our box and sit in front of a box of computer and watch in a box of computer or, or television, then we are living in a very artificial box life. And therefore, in order to bring true economy and in order to bring well-being, the true wealth, we need to be connected with nature. The greatest problem of our time, which, which gives birth to global warming, climate change, pollution, resource depletion, all these problems come from our disconnection with nature. And so solution is very simple. You don't have to have a rocket science to find the solution. You don't have to go to LSE or any big university to find solution. If the problem is our disconnection with nature, then solution is our reconnection with nature. Reconnection with nature. We go back and say every week, I would like to suggest, if you run a business, make it that all your staff, 
all your workers in your company have part of their job, part of their job, paid time, your workers should go for one day, half day out in nature to rejuvenate themselves, to renew themselves, their spirit, their imagination, their creativity. All imagination and creativity and art and music and poetry inspired by nature. Where will you have Van Gogh if there was no sunflower? So please tell me, who is more important? What is more important, Van Gogh or sunflower? You will go to auctioneer, Sotheby's or Christie's or some big auctioneer and pay 30, 40, 50,000 US dollars for Van Gogh painting. But the beautiful sunflower behind your back, around the corner, in the garden, you ignore it. So nothing, nothing, it's nature. I want to have a painting. <laughs> painting comes from the flower. All the great impressionists, where did they get? Monet created a garden so that he, he can paint flowers and bridges and ponds and lilies. And we are forgetting nature. And we are thinking we can have economy without nature. We can have economy without land. We can have economy and we can have wealth without forests, without animals, without any nature. Just these rise, rise, high rise, high rise buildings. Development, which is economic development, and growth, which is economic growth, we have forgotten that development has become destruction of nature. And investment, all those economic words, words in the economy that we, we teach and we learn, investment. Now I say to people that you must invest in nature. You must invest in people. What is more important, concrete or nature? You think Hong Kong should be famous, world city. I saw somewhere, world city. What is a world city? If you have concrete, concrete, concrete. What do you want to love? Do you want to love concrete or people? Do you want to love concrete or sunflowers and, and trees? And so if we invest in people and love people, if we invest in nature, there'll be true wealth. Of course you need houses. But I, Hong Kong is a small island. I would say, as a visitor, Hong Kong has enough houses. You have enough. You have plenty. You don't need more concrete. You need more nature. It's a small island. You have enough population here. You don't need more people. Let people like me come to Hong Kong as pilgrims for a visit, to meet friends. You don't need more people. You have enough people. You don't need more airports. You have enough people coming here and as already. You don't need third runway. <laughs> so if we can have that kind of ecological worldview where environment, nature, earth are in the center of our economy and wealth creation, then your development will mean human development. Development in spirituality, development in, uh, in uh, generosity, development in arts and culture and music and painting and dance and friendship. And people will have time for friends. At the moment, you, somebody rings you, friend, I want to see you, but I'm too busy. I don't have time. What kind of economy are you building if you have no time for your friends and your family and your neighbors? So true wealth is our human communities. True wealth is our friendship with our friends. If friendship is gone, families are gone, neighborhoods are gone, communities are gone, we are living isolated, individualistic life that is not ecological, that's egotistical. So if you want my kind of holistic economics, we have to go from this ego-centered economy to eco-centered economy. True economy is eco-centered, relationship-centered, not individualistic, separate, disconnected, isolated, 
individuals. We are all related. That's the holistic economics, that we are all related, interconnected, interdependent. I would go even a step further. Not only interdependent, we are dependent on nature. We depend on the earth, which gives us food. We depend on the rain, which gives us water. We depend on the sunshine, which gives us wonderful energy, sunshine. This artificial light is not necessary if you have a sunlight. We have to redesign our lecture theaters like this with sunlight coming naturally. And we have to design these theaters in such a way that natural air comes naturally. Natural air comes naturally and not artificial air conditioning. That will be a new challenge for a sustainable future. But this light is not sustainable. You have to go all the way to Middle East or some deep mining fracking, two miles under the sea, three miles under the sea, beyond the, this, the um, salt level of the sea to find this oil so that you can have millions and millions and millions of plastic bags so you can go to supermarket and put your vegetables that are already packaged in plastic in your plastic bag. And countries go to war to get oil, to protect the sources of oil. Countries go to war. Countries spend trillions and trillions of dollars, US dollars, on armaments to protect their resources of oil. And we get that oil, what we do? We put our delicious, fresh, clean water in plastic bottles and get our fresh, beautiful, fresh vegetables in these plastic bags. Trillions of plastic bags, we call it the economy. Trillions of plastic bags. Please tell me, is your plastic bag worth so much that you have to go to war for it? Is your plastic bottle in your economy, production of economy, production of plastic bottles, so valuable that you have to go to war and pollute the air and create global warming and climate change and transport this, this economy, production, transport around the world, globalization of economy? Globalization of nature is already there. We have a global air. What more do you want globalization? We have global sunshine. What more globalization do you want? We have globalization of love. Jesus Christ taught us love your neighbor as yourself. We have a globalization of Buddha, his teachings. And we have a globalization of many, many wonderful uh, Dalai Lama. Um, in, maybe in Hong Kong you must mention Dalai Lama. I don't know. But uh, maybe, maybe some other great teachers it's a, Dalai Lama is a metaphor. I'm not talking about uh, a person. It's a metaphor. So globalization of nature, globalization of culture, globalization of spirit, globalization of values is good. I'm not against globalization. I'm not a parochial, uh, narrow-minded um, patriot of a particular country. I'm a patriot of the soil, not of a flag. I'm a patriot of the land and the earth wherever it is. I want to have my roots into the soil. So I have a sense of place and a sense of rootedness in my Devon uh, country house where I live with two acres of garden and grow apples and, uh, and, and, uh, and uh, pears and plums and uh, strawberries and raspberries and potatoes and carrots and onions and asparagus. That's my patriotism. That's my economy. That's growing from the nature. And when you, I, t 10 minutes before I cook my lunch, I go and get some spinach and get some peas and get some potatoes from the garden, fresh. That's my luxury. Who wants to go uh, to supermarket two, three miles driving and then buy vegetables which are three days old already um, uh, harvested and then they are uh, put in plastic bag and a plastic polystyrene packaging and bring that stale food and say, I'm advanced. This is my progress. I have development. I'm rich. I'm wealthy. I can go to um, Walmart or some big, uh, big uh, supermarket and buy this. My luxury is fresh food. Ten minutes before I cook, I get fresh food from the garden. 
That is, for me, local economy within the context of global nature and culture and spirit. But this global economy where you have to transport everything thousands and thousands of miles away, that's not good holistic economy. I tell you one great, small example. Sometimes I go to France. And France is very famous for its wine, but also its Perrier water. And French water is very good because they can make very good wine. That's why they have good grapes and good water. But you go to supermarkets, which hardly I go, but sometimes friends take me to see what is happening there, not to buy, but to see it. What they sell, they sell highland water from Scotland. Okay? French water is not good enough for French people, so they have to buy highland water from Scotland. Then sometimes I go to Edinburgh. And in Edinburgh, I go to some shops, and I see there Perrier water. In Scotland, French water in Scotland. So, French water is not good enough for French to drink. Highland Scottish water is not good enough for Scottish people to drink. So they have to import water from France to Scotland and Scottish water export or an import in France, Perrier water. Now, is that economy? And in order to do that, you have to build roads, motorways, concrete, Lorries, driving, drivers driving 10 hours full of Perrier water to Scotland and then coming empty back to France. And then other lorries going full of Highland water to France. That is called global free trade. Globalization. WTO's mark on it. You have freedom to trade wherever you like. I say, this is not free trade this is free raid on nature, free raid on the environment, pollution, global warming, climate change, concrete um, buildings, lorries, and for that, so that French can have highland water and uh, Scottish can have Perrier water in their countries, we go to war. Is that worth it? We have to relearn to reconnect with nature, and relearn to live by the sun, relearn to live by the wind, relearn to live by the water, sun, wind, and water, and the soil. These are our true, true, true wealth. And then money, of course, you can use money to exchange your goods and services with each other. I'm not against money. And I'm sure in Hong Kong, people will not be able to live without some money. I'm not against money. I'm not against this kind of uh, trade either. I'm not Mahatma Gandhi, who Andrew mentioned, who is my mentor, was not against trade. Fair trade and trade like icing on the cake. I don't know if you have cake in Hong Kong and put icing on it. In England, we call it icing on the cake. It's a kind of metaphor. Icing on the cake. So if you don't have something, so if, say, French people have wonderful wine, but they can't make whiskey. So say, all right, we will send you 10 crates of wine. Please send two crates of whiskey. It's more expensive. Back. That's a reasonable trade. Because, I mean, you don't have to drink whiskey. I'm not advocating drinking whiskey or wine. I'm just using it as a metaphor for, uh, for illustrating my point. Then it's a fair trade, a proper trade in something you don't have in your country. So if you have a little bit of tea from somewhere, a little bit of coffee from somewhere, which is not that essential, you cannot survive without it, but it's a bit of nice to have a little luxury. So icing on the cake, that kind of international trade is fine, but 
Now we have icing, 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 but no cake. Local economy is the cake. And on that local economy, you put icing of global trade. That is a proper balance. Balance, proportion, harmony. These are the basic principles of tremendously uh, ancient um, Chinese wisdom from Taoism and harmony for Confucianism. Now I am told that in, uh, in China, uh, uh, harmony is a very, uh, very sort of popular word, and I like it. But harmony not only between the state and the population, also harmony between people, and harmony between people and nature. So China, Hong Kong, India, Europe, America, everywhere we have to find out this basic principle of harmony. Because nature is harmonious. The sun is in harmony with the plants. Photosynthesis, that's a harmony. Nature, uh, sun gives you energy, gives you life. Soil is in harmony with the plants. The moment you put one seed in the ground, in harmonious relationship, that seed sprouts and becomes a tree. And it has branches. And it has a blossom. And it has a fruit. That's harmony. And in that fruit, there is a seed. And that seed goes back into the soil. What a cyclical economy. I call this economy of nature, which moves in cycle, cyclical, like the sun is round, moon is round, earth is round, nature's economy is round. In nature's economy, there is no waste. In human, modern, industrial, consumer economy, waste, waste, waste. I mentioned plastic. I can mention many more things. If you want true holistic economy, only one rule, all my talk you can forget. Only one rule, make no waste. Zero waste economy is holistic economy. The modern industrial consumer materialistic economy is wasteful economy. We waste oil, we waste resources, we waste food. 40% of food in England is wasted. People in India are starving, and food is rotting in the warehouses. That's not economy. And we call ourselves educated, highly educated, only half educated, as at LSE, I said. And so if we can bring holistic economy in this sense that nature, people, land is nature, People, that's labor and capital, living in harmony, in balance, in right proportion, right balance, that everything has a place. Nothing in this universe is made without some purpose. Everything has a purpose. Everything has a meaning. This is a wonderful divine creation. It's a divine creation, sacred earth. If you go to American Indian culture, or, or Aboriginal culture. My two friends have come from Australia to visit me. Aboriginal culture. In Aboriginal culture, you have land is sacred. It's a dream time land. It's a land of song lines where people celebrate nature and community. If that we can bring, then I think we can build a true holistic economics. But then we have to deal with our greed. The modern economics is dependent and become dependent on our greed. And therefore, some of the money that we have, we have become a bit addicted to this kind of economy and money economy. We, it's become, even when people have enough, like in Hong Kong I said, you have enough wealth, you have enough houses, you have enough roads, you have enough airports, you don't need more. But there's a kind of addiction, you want more roads. We want more airports, we want more third runway, we want something more, we want more people. That's a kind of addiction, it's no purpose, there's no meaning. Now, please forgive me, this uh, uh, person coming from far away to speak to you, but 
This is not only Hong Kong problem. Hong Kong, I'm talking at just an illustration. This is a world problem. In the same way in, in London, we are fighting against the idea of third runway. I say to my friends in England, have we not got enough runways? I, island of Hong Kong is a small island, but also England, Great Britain is an island. Only an island. When you have built all the land into concrete, the buildings, motorways, airports, office blocks, housing estates, when you have concrete, co concreted the entire island of Great Britain, then where will your economy be? We want a creative economy, which is a holistic economics and true wealth, which will last like a cycle, not for 50 years, not for 500 years, but for 5 million years. That's the kind of economy we want. That's a sustainable economy, economy which can continue and which will last for 5 million years. That was the wisdom of the American Indian society. They used to say that when you are taking a decision, planning something to do, to make, to produce, to build, think of seventh generation. That was the wisdom of American Indian culture. Think of seventh generation. What will be the effect of your action today on the seventh generation? Do we think in those economic terms today? We think five year or one year or one quarter, the balance sheet of one quarter. How narrow, how short term our economy has become. So what I'm talking about holistic economics is a long term economics. A long term economics which will never see anything waste and anything polluted and anything exhausted. And that is possible. This economy which we have today, industrial, consumer, materialistic, based in material possessions, without any concern for the quality of life, quality of relationship, quality of being. Without that, we have built this consumer, um, uh, materialistic, industrial economy. This is not very long that we have done it. Last 100 years, today, um, when my friend took me somewhere, and he, he was showing me that these buildings, when 100 years ago, these were farms. So this economy that we have today is only 100, 150 years old. What is 100, 150 years old? It's a, a blink in the geological time, very short time. And this economy cannot survive. It's not sustainable. It has to change. And better we understand and embrace this holistic, ecological, sustainable, spiritually based in values, human values, ecological values, spiritual values, holistic values, based that economy, which can last forever and ever, has to come because this economy cannot last. It will crumble under its own weight. And I tell you, it's already starting to happen. In Spain, in Italy, Europe altogether, 20% people unemployed. And globalization, where have the jobs gone? They've gone to somewhere, other countries. People are not making things. So this cannot last. And so, um, like apartheid came to an end, Berlin Wall came down, the racial discrimination in the United States came down, who would have thought that when Martin Luther King was campaigning for the end of racial discrimination, a black man will be in the White House? Who would have thought? But we have. So the change is possible. What is made by humans can be changed by humans. And so this kind of unsustainable, unecological, environmentally uh, un, uh, undesirable economy has to change. And so that change will come not from the top, not from London and, and Washington DC and White House and Tokyo and New Delhi and Beijing and many, many other cities at the top. The change will come when people begin to take steps in right direction, when you be the leaders, be the change you want to see in the world. That was Mahatma Gandhi's message. 
So if people take initiative, start to make small steps in the right direction, make connection with nature, go out once a week and work in, on, on the garden, grow some food, uh, reconnect with nature, go and walk by the river, or swim in the clean, clean sea, and then you see the sea is not clean, then you demand that we want clean sea so that we can swim in the sea. Then change will come, and change is possible. So I end with this hope. I want to end with this optimism that we can be the engines of change. Even the business can be the engine of change. Even the, the corporations can look and see. Because at that time, when they were uh, thinking of this industrial economy, they thought this will bring well-being, and this will bring um, uh, development, and the poverty will end, and, and discrimination will end, and everybody will have plenty. But this economy has not brought an end to poverty. This has not brought an end to inequality. This economy has not brought any true well-being of large numbers of people. People are under stress. People are under depression. People are uh, lost, lonely, isolated, disconnected. This is not well-being. This is not wealth. So we have realized after going through this 100 years of industrial uh, and, and materialistic, an uh, unholistic, uh, uh, fragmented economy. So now we can realize that we had it enough. Now let us think a better, more harmonious, holistic economics and a true wealth so that we can live joyfully and, 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 and a good relationship with nature and people. Thank you very much. Thank you, Satish. That was phenomenal. Phenomenal. You've really identified for us the madness of our economic system. You've shown us that the missing element is the relationship with ecology. And you've also shown us that the key is to reconnect with nature and to reconnect with the sacredness of all life. And you've done it with so much clarity, so many examples, so much enthusiasm, so much joy, and so few notes. <laughs> Straight from the heart, pouring out. <laughs> and I know that many people here are doing great work for the environment. But few people can really articulate the issues and make the links as clearly as Satish has. And when you hear someone doing that, it's a huge boost. So I can't thank you enough, Satish. We will be having questions. Um, but the last thing I want to say, just to share with you, a question that was uh, put to Satish um, at uh, the last talk you gave at a university here in Hong Kong. And the person said, Satish, you are so different and amazing. I've never heard such wonderful ideas. You do not seem like a real person. <laughs> Can you give us an idea of your daily life? And... <laughs> And your response, as, as, I, as I was told, was, I am an ordinary person. I have a, a wife and family and a small house and a garden and I cook and I clean. So, so you don't have to ask that question. <laughs> so we're going to break now for 10 minutes. 10 minutes. And um, is there some refreshments outside still? There, there may or may not, but in any case, you can use the washroom, have a, have a break for 10 minutes, and we'll come back for around half an hour of uh, questions. Okay, okay so uh, we'll take some questions now. Uh, anybody like to break the ice? Over in the side there. Yep. There. 
Oh, oh yes, we need a mic. Yeah, thanks, Stella. Thank you, Satish. Um, can you um, share how you have gone about um, influencing the people in the business communities or the business world, uh, people in the stock market, how to redefine wealth? Yeah, yeah, okay. Um, I say to business people that uh, <clears throat> You need to think in terms of triple bottom line. Of course, you need to balance the books. I'm not opposing that. But balancing the books also requires balancing two other balance sheet factors. The other two factors for in your balance sheet should be people and how your workers and how your customers and how your suppliers are faring, and their welfare, their well-being. Your relationship with the people who are related to your business is more than just a financial transaction. You are coming in touch with real people. So developing caring, friendly, human relationship while you are doing business, that is important. So, um, Impact of your business on people, that is the second bottom line. And the third bottom line is how your business is making impact on the environment. Is your business doing harm to nature? If your business is doing harm to nature, even if you are making profit, it's not going to be sustainable and you are not going to be very popular eventually. So if you want to be popular, if you want to be loved businessmen and women, and if you want to be respected businessmen and women, then please consider three bottom lines on your balance sheet. And please appoint somebody who is a little bit more a kind of uh, um, outsider slightly, um, uh, so that th th those people can look at your business and see, are you successful? in maintaining those three bottom lines, triple bottom lines. Your financial profit, your, um, your impact on people, and your impact on the environment. If those three things can be balanced, then you are a good businesswoman and man. If those three lines, three bottom lines, are not good together, then please look at your business. I'm not confronting them. I say business is good. We all need to do business. Even my magazine I publish, even though it is um, a not-for-profit, still it is a business. I need uh, readers. I need um, people who can write for it. I need people who can illustrate for it. So uh, we need to do business, but do business without doing harm to people or to nature. Then it's a good business. And so I think business people are very sympathetic to this idea. They don't think that what I'm saying is crazy or stupid or radical or eccentric or something like that. They do see it. They quite often agree with it. But then they say, but social systems are so, the political systems are so, the financial systems are so, I can't just survive. So I say, let's try to change that financial system. Make a right step in the right direction. Slowly, slowly, if we work together, we can change it. And so I am, even in Hong Kong, I'm going to address some business people in coming days. So that is my message to business people, that do business, but without harming. Um, thank you for your talk. Could I ask, to what extent are your thoughts influenced by your Indian origin? Say, uh, Hinduism and the Indian way of life and the Indian way of seeing the world. Thank you. Uh, the question is how my thoughts are influenced by Indian philosophy, Indian way of life, and Indian spirituality, like Buddhism and other. Uh, <clears throat> As you know, my family comes from a Jain background. And Jain religion is very similar to Buddhist religion. And, uh, and also, uh, the Hindu uh, religion considers the entire natural world and human world 
as sacred. And there's a little story I tell you. There was, this is a Hindu story from Hindu religion. There was um, a student called Satyakama. And he went to his teacher, a Hindu sage teacher living in the forest. And he said to the guru, that I want to learn. I want to learn about life. I want to learn about society. I want to learn about nature. I want to gain knowledge. So please teach me. And so the teacher said, all right, I give you these 400 cows. And you take these 400 cows to the forest and look after them. They are a bit sickly cows. They are a bit thin. They are a little bit need uh, nurturing. You look after these cows. And when these 400 cows become 1,000, then come back. And so this uh, Satyakama went into the forest. And during this time, he came to learn about drought, about rain, about sunshine, about plants, which plants are what quality, the herbs, the food, um, everything he learned about nature. And then, it's a mythological story, so uh, one day, one bull, very nice, good, healthy, good-looking young bull came to Satyakama that I am the 1,000th and we have, you have completed your guru's instructions. And I want to teach you something. Satyakama said, you want to teach me something? What do you want to teach me? Bull says that God is east. The west is God. The north is God. The south is God. And the rest of the knowledge you will learn from the fire. And so now we can go back to our guru. And so Satyakama starts to walk back. And then uh, next evening, he makes fire. And the fire speaks to him and says, the birds are God, the trees are God, all the animals are God, the insects are God, all living creatures are God, full of sacred life, divine. And next you will learn from the swan. So, okay, Satyakama travels towards his guru's uh, school, at the ashram. And third night, he lights the fire by a lake. And in the lake, there's a beautiful swan. And the swan comes to him and says that even the minerals are God. Even the, the things in the, the, below the surface are God. And even the ocean is God. And so he said, wow. Then, fourth day, he arrives to his guru and says that uh, I have come back. And guru says, your face is shining. You are looking very knowledgeable. And, and you have learned everything. He says, yes, forest has taught me. The bull has taught me. The, the uh, fire has given me knowledge. The swan has taught me. But uh, you are my guru. I want to learn from you. Please teach me the true knowledge. And then the guru says that in your eyes, I can see shining, shining eyes. So you have in your eyes God. And then God is also in your heart. And God is within you. And so... The Satyakama now is educated. That is the Indian stories, Indian culture, how we view nature. There's an Upanishad, Sanskrit. In Sanskrit, we say, Isha vashyam idam sarvam yatkincha jagatyam jagat. Everything in this universe is sacred. Everything in this universe is to be respected. Everything in this universe to be taken with gratitude. So, soil, I'm grateful to you for feeding me. Air, I'm grateful to you for giving me the breath of life. Sunshine, I'm grateful to you for giving me light and energy. Everything in the universe I receive as a gift of life. 
with gratitude, not as a human right. I have a right to uh, kill animals. I have a right to mine. I have a right to destroy forests. I have a right to overfish. Human rights, no nature rights. In Hindu religion, say, we say nature has rights because nature is as much divine and, and God as human beings. So I learned from Hindu religion the nature is also God. And, uh, and my religion is nature. And so from nature, I receive the wisdom, which is divine wisdom. Um, when I, we praise God, what do we praise? How do we praise in poetry? We praise the sunshine. If you read Vedas, it's a hymn to the earth, hymn to the rain God, hymn to the sun God, hymn to all divine creation. So... God is not something abstract in your kind of uh, thoughts. God is present everywhere. So when you praise the God, you write poem for the uh, sun, for the moon, for the night, for the day, for the lake, for the flowers, for human beings, for your love, for your beloved, for your, um, for your uh, person with whom you fall in love. All that is part of divine. So when we can have this expanded big heart, open heart, and big mind, when our consciousness is expanded to include all life, then that is divine. So that spirituality I learned from the Indian religion and Hindu, Buddhist, Jain. They all have something in common, that we are all children of the earth and children of God and children of nature. There is no separation. In Hindu philosophy, there is no dualism. It is not that God is somewhere behind the sky behind somewhere in heaven and pulling strings and he created the world in six days and seventh day he went to sleep and he sleeps behind the clouds. It's not. God for Hindu religion is not separate. We say dancing Shiva. So the universe is the dance of Shiva, dance of God. So my hands moving is Shiva dancing. My lips moving, Shiva dancing. Everything is divine. It's Indra's net. We call it in Hindu tradition, universe is Indra's net. And the net is knotted with a diamond. Each knot is a with diamond. And in each diamond, the entire universe is reflected. It's a unity of life. And that even in a way, now even the quantum physics is confirming and reaffirming that philosophy of non-dualism. The unity of life. There is no separation and distinction and, and a fragmentation between the observer and the observed, between the subject and the object. So like even a Christian uh, theologian called um, Thomas Berry said, the universe is not a collection of objects. It's a communion of subjects. It's all one. So that unity of life manifesting in Millions of forms, diversity. So unity of life and diversity of life are not in contradiction. There is, a, there is a complementarity between unity and diversity. But modern, unholistic economics, industrial mindset creates not unity, but uniformity. So if you go to Hong Kong or to New York or to other big cities, same, same, same kind of buildings, sameness. Uniformity is not unity. We are all people, but we are all different. So the, the diversity, the unity, we are all members of one human family. But some are black, some are white, some are short, some are tall, some have blonde hair, some have black hair, etc., etc. So diversity is a dance of Shiva. Shiva does not just stand in one position. Thousands and thousands of forms of dancing. So it's a dancing Shiva. That's a Hindu uh, philosophy and Hindu spirituality. And so if we have that diversity and unity and beyond uh, everything, dualism, we reach for unity of life, then unity and, 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 and what modern world creates is uniformity and also division. Instead of diversity, division. You are Indian, I'm Chinese. You are black, I'm white. You are man, I'm woman. We are separate, we are distinct. Uh, this separation. And that comes from great French philosopher called Rene Descartes, who said, I think, therefore I am. I say to Monsieur Descartes, metaphorically, 
I shut you in this room, no food, no water, no sunshine. Please live in your thoughts, in your head. <laughs> How long will you survive? So, uh, so in Hindu philosophy, we say, so hum. The other is therefore I am. The sun is, the moon is, the rain is, the earth is, the soil is, the other people are, my parents are, therefore I am. So my, one of my book is called, You Are, Therefore I Am. So hum. So that's a deep Hindu spirituality which informs my holistic economics. Thank you for that beautiful answer. Um, time is running short, so I think we have time for one more uh, question, Simon. Dr. Kimura, um, obviously we can see you are a wonderful, shining example of the fusion of the East and the West. And Hong Kong, I think, as a society, is just the opposite. We are getting the worst of both worlds. What advice can you give this community tonight? Please. East and West coming together, and uh, Hong Kong people, as you say, uh, are going in a sort of separate, separate ways. Uh, there is no, as Mahatma Gandhi said, there is no way to peace. Peace is the way. In the same way, there's no way to bringing East and West together and humanity together than bringing it together. And how do you bring it together? By being aware, by being mindful. So when you are mindful, for example, when I was going to, uh, to Pakistan on my great walk uh, between, um, from India to, to Europe and America, I went to Pakistan, and when I, enter, I, was, I was entering to Pakistan, many of my friends said that you are going to Pakistan, enemy country. We have three wars between India and Pakistan. And you have no money, no food, and walking. Your security is in danger. At least please take some food with you. I said, my teacher said, go with trust in your heart. And these packets of food, they are not packets of food. They are packets of mistrust. What am I going to say to Pakistanis that I did not trust you, whether you will feed me or not, so I have brought my own food all the way from India. And then my friend was in tears. I said, why are you crying? Give me your blessings. She said, Satish, this might be our last meeting. You are going to communist countries, capitalist countries, Muslim countries, Christian countries, deserts, mountains, forests, no money, no food, walking. How are you going to survive? You may not come back alive. I fear. I said, from today, I say to you that if I die while walking for peace, that is the best kind of death that I can have. So, no fear of death. And if I don't get food, I will say, this is my opportunity to fast. <laughs> and if I don't get shelter, I'll sleep under the stars. And that will be my million star hotel. <laughs> Who cares for five star hotel? <laughs> so, no fear of death and no fear of hunger. And I went into Pakistan with that. And miracle happened. Some Pakistani heard about my journey and with my friend, two of us going. And he came from Lahore to welcome me without my knowing. And he said, are you Mr. Kumar and Mr. Menon, the two Indians who are coming to Pakistan for peace? I said, yes, we are. But how did you know? Because we did not know anybody in Pakistan. And he said, I heard about you and read about you in the newspaper. And I said, I'm for peace. The war between India and Pakistan is complete nonsense. So I've come to welcome you. Please come to my home. Now, five minutes ago, my friend was saying that you are going to a Muslim enemy country in Pakistan. And here it is. Five minutes later, this Muslim enemy, so-called enemy, is welcoming me and saying, I want you to come to my home. At that moment, I said, if I come here 
as an Indian, I meet a Pakistani. If I come here as a Hindu, I meet a Muslim. So I come here as a human being, and I will meet human beings everywhere. That is the way to bring East and West together. That is the way to bring all humanity together. Then you can be a Chinese, you can be an Indian, you can be an American, but before you are a Chinese or Indian or Australian or American, you are a human being. And that way you bring East and West and North and South together. This is what, uh, what the, the bull said to Satyakama, that God is East, God is West, God is North, God is South, God is in every human heart. The God is in every human eyes. There is no separation between us. You are my brother. The, the birds are my sisters. The worms are my kith and kin. All we are related. If you have that consciousness, then all your fragmentation will melt away. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. A very beautiful note to end on. Thank you so much, Satish, for your eloquent, enthusiastic answers. I also uh, want to uh, share with you about the magazine, Resurgence and Ecologist. This is the latest issue. I think this is the first combined issue, is that right? The second combined issue of these two magazines. Resurgence has kind of taken on the ecologist, uh, <laughs> I think. <laughs> Be diplomatic. Um, and uh, this will be on sale outside, and you also have the opportunity to subscribe to it. And it is uh, a magazine with uh, wide-ranging material along the lines of what Satish has been sharing with us, uh, reading along the top line, environment, activism, social justice, arts, and ethical living. So there's a tremendous amount uh, of very wonderful, uplifting uh, informative material in this magazine. So please do subscribe. Um, I also uh, want to share with those of you who don't know that the Kaduri Farm does have a very wide range of programs, uh, wonderful staff developing uh, networks for connecting people to nature and, uh, and to the land. Uh, there's many courses, events, workshops, and so on. So please do visit the website and find out what's going on, and, and we'd love to see you there, um, www.kfbg.org.